I'm not the Indian you had in mind. I've seen him, I've seen him ride. Rush of wind, darkening tide, with wolf and eagle by his side, his buttocks firm and well-defined. My God, he looks good from behind, but I'm not the Indian you had in mind. I'm not the Indian you had in mind. I've heard him, heard him roar, the warrior wild in the video store, the movies that we all adore, the cliches that we can't rewind, but I'm not the Indian you had in mind. I'm not the Indian you had in mind. I've known him, oh, I've known him well. The bear greased hair, the pungent smell, the piercing eye, the startling yell. Thank God he's the friendly kind, but I'm not the Indian you had in mind. I'm that other Indian, the one who lives just down the street, the one you're disinclined to meet, the Oka guy, remember me? Hipperwash, wounded knee? That other one who runs the local bar, the CEO, the movie star, the elder with her bingo tails, the activist alone in jail. That other Indian, the doctor, the homeless bum, the boys who sing around the drum, the relative I cannot bear, my father who is never there. He must have hated me, I guess. My best friend's kid with FAS, the single mom who drives the bus. I'm all of these, and they are us. Of course, you can always ask this buck you like so much, this Indian you idolize. Perhaps that's wisdom on his face, compassion sparkling in his eyes. He may as well have a secret song, a dance he'll share, a long-lost chant. Ask him to help you save the world, to save yourselves. Don't look at me. I'm not the Indian you had in mind. I can't. The intent of this project all starts when I was around 17 years old. I remember sitting down and my grandma telling me her earliest recollections of her days in the Indian residential school. If you've ever seen your grandma cry, it'll break your heart. And that day it broke mine, and ever since, I've been on a mission to replace, fix, or even reveal what's missing in Canadian education systems. Tanse, Etienne Mustas Lafferty Nitsi Kasson, Grandpa Yotsenia, Nemamo Nigi Higua Sturgeon Lake Hello, my name is Etienne Mustas Lafferty, and this is my story. In my earlier years, I guess I wouldn't say that I knew I was different in any way. I attended a public school just like everyone else I had grown up knowing. But my first time that I remember being proud of who I was was in kindergarten. I had a really open-minded, amazing kindergarten teacher who invited my mom in to come and talk about Cree people and their ways and their histories. I remember this being pivotal for me in that it was the first time I ever felt very proud. I remember the teacher telling me to move back because I was sitting right in front of my mom where the other students couldn't see. I was so proud that she came in dressed up in the most beautiful hide dress. I remember this as being the last time that I would ever feel proud of who I was. This came as no fault to my mom's, because regardless of how I felt, she never let me forget who I was. It became known to many that my sister and I were the Indians in the school, and as I could recall, there were very few of us around. Growing up, I became privy to many racist conversations. Apparently, I didn't fit the bill when it came to looking like a stereotypical native person. Anytime anyone would say something horrible about Indigenous people, I would either stay silent, shrug it off, or laugh. I never had the tools to fight back, and I never had the knowledge. Here it is, an image that encompasses everything about this project and everything that I've been talking about. Growing up, I always heard people say this, you don't look like an Indian. Sometimes people would say, what are you? You look so exotic. And usually when I would say that I was Cree, I was met with a look of disgust, sometimes similar to when you ate something that you thought was gonna be something else and tasted awful. 
So why this look? Why this reaction? Why is it that we have this idea in our heads about what indigeneity is, who indigenous people look like, and what kind of physical characteristics they need to embody? I now have an amazing husband who surprisingly is not white, but comes from Irish descent and is of the Gwich'in Nation up north. We now have a beautiful daughter named Layla, and as you can see, she's taken up every physical characteristic of her father. But despite her blonde hair and her beautiful blue eyes, this fair-skinned warrior is very much a part of her Cree and Gwich'in culture. I'm fearful of the conversations that she may enter, as she too will be privy to many racist conversations. I am hopeful that our education system will make the necessary changes so that she doesn't have to grow up being ashamed of who she is. I left classroom teaching when Layla was about two. I was given an amazing opportunity to work with other Indigenous educators on reconciliation through education. I worked provincially and at the local level to help teachers better understand topics such as treaties, residential schools, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the calls to action, and resources. Nothing so far had touched anything close to images of Indigenous people. Some of my favorite conversations, regardless of the ones that I've had in the past, are usually with teachers sitting down and talking about what they need in order to move forward. When looking at the TQS, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of excitement, and there's a lot of hope. But for some reason, this one here usually gets teachers. They're always wondering what resources are accurate, or how do I accurately reflect the strength and diversity of First Nations and Métis people. This brings me to my current state. There's two motivations behind this project. One comes from a conversation with a colleague who was really challenged by her students saying stereotypical racist comments about Indigenous people. She felt that if she had the tools and the knowledge to say something back, she would be able to better educate her students about the history and contemporary issues Indigenous peoples face. These were the same tools that I needed when I was a young Indigenous girl. And these are the same tools that I wish my family, friends, even my teachers had. So I became motivated to create a workshop for teachers on images of indigeneity. The second motivation behind this project is my work at the University of Alberta as a grad student in secondary education. I'm currently enrolled in a curriculum studies class that has called on me to create a final project of my liking, and I've chose to do a video. Curriculum studies is a dynamic, interdisciplinary, and ever-changing field. Curriculum as inquiry requires that we ask questions and tell stories about education that includes not only day-to-day -day formal interactions, but also how education extends beyond the walls of our classrooms. Curriculum or curriculum studies is a complicated conversation, much like the ones I've encountered in the past. In this project, I will highlight images of indigeneity in film and media, news and sports, and finally children's literature, and link it all to my idea about how curriculum is, again, as mentioned, extending beyond the walls of our classroom. The structure of this project is inspired by an incredible educator named Marie Batiste, who is best known for her work in decolonizing education. I was fortunate enough to see her and listen to her speak at the Think Indigenous Education Conference, March 14th, 2018. Something she said really hit home. She said that in order to decolonize education, we need to start deconstructing what we think or assume we know about Indigenous people or history and start reconstructing it with new and relevant and contemporary ideas of Indigenous people. 
Marie says that educational institutions and systems in Canada are also feeling the tensions and the pressures to make education accessible and relevant to Aboriginal people. What is apparent to Indigenous education is the need for a serious and far-reaching examination of the assumptions inherent in Eurocentric curricula. She says that decolonization is a process of unpacking powerful Eurocentric assumptions of education, its narratives of race and difference in curriculum and pedagogy. She says that decolonizing Indigenous education must be framed within concepts of dialogue, respect for educational pluralities, multiplicities, and diversities. The goal of eliminating racism, according to Batiste, cannot be achieved if we continue to use or rely on the concept of race. Educators, teachers, and researchers must challenge the typological methods used to create the false concepts of race thus being in this circumstance image. When we think about images in movies, the first thought that comes to mind is Peter Pan and Pocahontas. Of course, we all watch these and we didn't grow up racist, but they are problematic. I'm going to show you a video to get you thinking more about images in movies and how it may impact children who watch. Teach him, pale-faced brother, all about red man. Indians! <laughs> ah, Blackfoot tribe. Belongs to the Algonquin group. Quite savage, you know. Let's go get him. Come on, we'll get him. Their skins are hellish red. They're only good when dead. They're vermin, as I said, and worse. They're savages, savages. Barely even human. I found it a bit of a challenge to find scholarly writings on children's programming. However, I did find one called Move Over and Make Room for Mika, The Representation of Race, Otherness, and Indigeneity on the Australian Children's Television Program, Play School. So Play School is a program in Australia, which is one of the longest running television shows for preschool aged children, and is best known for its representations of difference. It presents children with ideas of family life, social experience, and cultural activities in Australia. The Look Through the Window segment of the program it is an opportunity to present to children concepts of difference, and it is a literal gaze out into the outside world. They have looked out the window and saw Southeast Asian naming ceremonies, two deaf children signing together as they bathed their black and Asian dolls in the tub, a song about hair surrounded by images of a range of people of diverse backgrounds, and two lesbian moms who were pictured taking their children and her friend to an amusement park. 
So looking at the show from an Indigenous studies and critical race lens, McKinley and Barney began to wonder what kinds of representations of Indigenous Australians were on the show. Looking through the archives, they discovered that there never featured Indigenous peoples in the Look Out the Window segment. They have stated in their article that the absence of the contemporary lived realities of Indigenous peoples' lives and experiences today speaks volumes about the type of gaze perpetuated on this program. I guess what is least known about Canadian children's television and what McKinley and Barney bring to light is the appearance of Buffy St. Marie on Sesame Street from 1976 to 1981. She appeared in episodes dealing with breastfeeding and sibling rivalry, and during the five years that she was on Sesame Street, she said that she tried to convey the very strong message that Indians exist. She said, we are alive and real, we have fun, friends, families, and a whole lot to contribute to the rest of the world through our reality. Here's a short video highlighting her time at Sesame Street. If you guess what I am thinking of, Mm -hmm. you get to hug it. I get to hug it? You get to hug it. Whatever it is. I just had one goal. I just wanted little kids and their their grown-ups to understand that Indians exist. Indians exist. We're not dead and stuffed in the museums like the dinosaurs. We're not. We really are real. We have friends, we have family, we have music, we have culture, and we have a lot of fun. Here are the wolf childs. There's Buffy and Sheldon and Cody. They said they were going to... When I first started um, doing Sesame Street, uh, Sheldon Wolfchild and I had just gotten together. And um, uh, Sheldon is Cody's dad. And we were all on Sesame Street together as a family. Boy, now that's real family teamwork. Sheldon's an actor. He's now on the tribal council of his reserve in Minnesota. Well, Cody and Sheldon and I have to go back to Hawaii today. What? Yeah, we do. No. I'm afraid so. Oh, so can't go Cody home. stay? No, I'm afraid he can't. Cody lives in Hawaii. Um, he's a keyboard player in, a, in a, a reggae band, and they travel throughout the islands. I had been doing Sesame Street for not very long, and uh, I found out that Sheldon and I were expecting a baby. And I told Sesame Street, well, I guess that's the end of me on Sesame Street, but they, they got back in touch and they said, no, we've never explored having a family on Sesame Street. Uh, we did family things, we did breastfeeding, uh, the way that, um, that they handled it was beautiful. <laughs> what you doing, Buffy? I'm feeding the baby. See, he's drinking milk from my breast. Again, they just had the gentlest, most direct touch. And it's good for him. And I get to hug him when I do it, see. When I put out a search to find Canadian children's programming with Indigenous characters, I was not shocked to find that there was nothing there. The images that I saw were people and animals and cartoons, but no Indigenous people. I do recall one morning watching CBC Kids with Layla and the character Cotton Ball was featured learning how to powwow or learning about powwow. I remember being quite shocked to see this as so far in programming, we have been absent. So what do we make of this? If children are indeed social actors who create their own culture, and this includes understandings of race, what do we make of the children's programming that exists in Canadian television or globally? To say that Indigenous people are underrepresented in children's television is an understatement. The absence of Indigenous people in children's programming suggests many things, one being that there isn't a place for Indigenous images in children's programming, and what that suggests to larger society is there's no place for them there. This is the curriculum that extends beyond the classroom. Given the amount of screen time that children are given nowadays, these thoughts disturb me. And I can only help but think of the many different portrayals of Indigenous people that we see on television. 
A website titled Mashable highlights the underrepresentation of Indigenous people in television. It says, despite the recent diversity breakthrough in shows such as Blackish and Fresh Off the Boat, Native people as a whole are largely left out of the picture on the small screen. They make cameos and subplots, but don't get the reins to their own series. Jonathan Joss, an Indigenous actor who is known for playing John Redcorn in King of the Hill and also Chief Ken Hotete in Parks and Recreation. He says that, In my career, I've played a drunk, a holy man, an Indian on horseback. It hasn't been until the last 15 years that I've been able to wear a nice suit. When I try to think of a show that best describes or depicts Indigenous people, the only one that comes to mind would be Corner Gas. Again, I found it challenging to locate scholarly research on images of indigeneity in news. But I read an article once that said the only way that indigenous people are on the news is if they are the four D's, drumming, dancing, drunk, or dead. When I think about criminal investigations and they say the suspect is Aboriginal, I can't help but wonder, what is that supposed to look like? Is it one of the images you saw at the beginning of the video? Is he or she First Nations, Cree, Blackfoot? Is he or she Métis? Is he or she Inuit? How do we use one word to describe one look? I found a great article by Robert Harding titled, The Media, Aboriginal People, and common sense, and in it they highlight so many disturbing facts about Indigenous people in news, primarily in print. Harding sheds a light on the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which we know also as RCAP. In the article it stated that RCAP included that Aboriginal people in issues are often excluded from the media altogether. On the occasions when they are registered on the public agenda, their voices are routinely misappropriated. In this article study, the author tries to reveal the hard facts about Indigenous people in the media. In the 90 articles with Indigenous topics, the most present were treaty negotiations, fishing and hunting, and the most common was about reserves. They had found that 44% of the articles represented Indigenous people as the pathetic victim stereotype. 31% of the stories represented the angry warrior type of stereotype. And only 3% represented Indigenous people as the noble environmentalist. They had found in the study that 59% of the news items that were reported were mostly being seen as unsympathetic toward Indigenous people. 20% were coded as being sympathetic, and 18 were neutral. Harding concludes by saying how the study sheds light on some disturbing patterns in the Canadian print coverage of Aboriginal people and their issues. This is the curriculum that extends beyond the classroom. Perhaps the best article, and by far the most recent, and you can see by my markings here, is by McLean, Wilson, and Lee. It's titled, The Whiteness of Red Men, Indigenous Mascots, Social Media, and Anti-Racist Intervention. Francis and King are quoted in the article as using critical race theory and anti-racist theory to explain the production, regulation, and control of images of Indigenous people in a white settler context. That context is produced through a history of colonial policies and practices that exalt white settler identities and institutions while denying Indigenous people self-determination. This paper focuses on a social media campaign informed by anti-racist theory that sought to remove a high school sports team named the Redmen and the associated mascot. This was called hashtag change Redmen campaign. After a long battle, the Redman mascot was retired and the name was changed to the Red Hawks. Cited in McLean, Wilson, and Lee is a quote by Levitt, who says that mascots signify stock tropes of indigeneity and masculinity that freeze Indigenous people 
into the colonial era. Farn is also quoted here as saying, Indigenous mascots collapse hundreds of diverse Indigenous nations into one caricature with characteristics such as clothing and feathers that belong only to some of the Plains nations. McLean, Wilson, and Lee conclude that these reductive and often paradoxical representations are used by institutions such as schools and the mainstream media to regulate indigeneity. I'm less likely to enter into conversations about sports mascots, but I want to highlight here that this again is the curriculum that extends beyond the classroom, yet another complicated conversation. In Decolonizing Methodologies, Research in Indigenous Peoples by Linda Smith, she speaks about Maori writer Patricia Grace. She said that books are dangerous to Indigenous readers, and here's why. She said that books do not reinforce our values, actions, customs, culture, and identity. Secondly, when they tell us only about others, they're saying we do not exist. Three, they may be writing about us, but saying things which are untrue. And four, they may be writing about us, but saying negative and insensitive things, which tell us that we are not good. I would argue that books are dangerous for all readers. In an article titled Images for Confident Control, Stereotypes and Imperial Discourse, Mangan says that the purpose of education was to instill in British children the appropriate attitudes of dominance. Megan says in the article that stereotypes existed to manipulate reality in order to reflect imperial values, ambitions, and priorities and to promote them as proper, necessary, and constructive. Mangan says that school curriculum is an integral and significant part of the culture of society and an effective source of power. So textbooks within the curriculum also promote and sustain political ideologies through the careful presentation of human beings. Finally, to conclude, Mangan says that looming over our education system, institution and curriculum was, and probably I would argue still is, the heavy shadow of stereotypic image. Thank goodness our books don't look like this. Or do they? Up until recently, many of us Indigenous education consultants in various districts have put out a call to learning commons or library professionals to take a look at what's really in our educational spaces. The books pictured here is a collection from Edmonton Public Schools, a collection they now call the Weed Out Books. Uh, These are books as seen as being not worthy of being in our classrooms. And they certainly shouldn't be in our learning commons. Within the last year, I created a resource called Out With The Old, In With The New. And this was, I guess, my own call to action to give to educators, to give to their learning commons professionals, and challenge them to find books that did not belong. So far, two major schools went through a complete revamp of their library, getting rid of what was found as being inappropriate and replacing it with new books that accurately reflect the diversity and strength of First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. This is the curriculum that extends beyond the classroom. See, some of these books weren't so bad, mostly really old or dealing with terminology that we didn't use anymore. But as you can see, most of the books, again, depict Indigenous people in a historical sense, never evolving, never contemporary. Some of the books even making light of what we consider to be sacred ceremonies and a part of our own Indigenous knowledge systems. When teachers ask me where to start, I always say literature. Although sometimes it's not an easy road, it's probably the best place to start. I found a great article called Going Down the Rabbit Hole, Teachers' Engagements with Dialectical Images in Canadian Children's Literature on Social Justice. This article investigates pre-service elementary teachers' responses to Canadian multicultural literature. Strong, Wilson, Yoder, and Phipps 
look at residential school literature and link this to critical nostalgia, which is a lens for looking at trauma studies, curriculum theory, and critical pedagogies related to remembrance. Looking at residential school from these lenses proves helpful for non-Indigenous teachers engaging in these very difficult stories. Inspired by Roger Simon's work, they say that in order to read a text properly, it requires holding both the text and the image in tension. So can children's picture books function as dialectical images? That is to analyze the picture for pedagogical intent. In this study, they use Shishi Etko to interpret dialectical images. On the last page showing a dark and eerie image of the cattle truck leaving, Wilson, Yoder, and Phipps say that this image becomes a disruption to the rest of the book that contains mostly warm and fuzzy images. So the teachers in the study named this image as having considerable amount of shock value. It's interesting when we talk about remembrance or trauma because a lot of teachers are very concerned about traumatizing their children. And I always tell them what I heard Cindy Blackstock say at a CAS conference last year. She said, it's not the children who are afraid to learn, it's the teachers who are afraid to teach. Layla and I have read every single book written about residential schools. And just like I know what she's capable of, I feel that teachers too will know how to confidently and creatively talk about residential schools with their classrooms. It's a difficult topic, but if we tread lightly and go slowly, I know that we can create amazing conversations with our young ones in classes. Perhaps one of the most enlightening pieces of this project is McLean, Wilson and Lee's very enlightening, positive approach to Reconstructing Indigenous Resurgence. So I'm just going to pull a couple of quotes from that article. It says that social media in its increased accessibility to Indigenous peoples provides a public space where people can openly challenge stereotypical representations, thereby disrupting and circumventing institutional regulation and control. They say that social media has changed the nature of communication with sites like Facebook and Twitter because the primary sources of communication where Indigenous people can find out what is happening is now available and these are our networks in the world. Recent research indicates that Indigenous people are using media at rates of 20% higher than non-Indigenous people. This is a major part of Indigenous resurgence. Through social media, Indigenous people can narrate their own stories, produce their own symbols of representation, and challenge racializing practices. I'm going to conclude by putting Marie Batiste's theories to work. I want to end with positive, reconstructed images of Indigeneity in film, literature, and social media. These are images that accurately reflect the beauty that is Indigenous people, culture, and history. These are the sites for resurgence. It is this that will hopefully become the new curriculum.